Welcome to another Mr. James Accounting Tutorial. This time we are looking at Accounting Unit 1 of KEEP and uh, I'll be doing the entire series of past people from 2013 right down to 2019. And there was no people in 2020. Part E. The regulatory framework requires companies to provide users with relevant and reliable financial statements that record the economic substance of transactions. Using appropriate examples, explain the following accounting terms. Substance over form, relevance, and reliability. We start with substance over form. Substance refers to the practical aspects of the transaction and form refers to the legal aspect. The practical takes precedence over the legal aspect of the transaction when recorded. An example, the purchase of a non-current asset on higher purchase. The legal form of the transaction says the assets belong to the seller until the last installment is paid. Therefore, it should not be recorded in the business books at the time of the initial agreement. However, since the business has practical use of and the asset is no different from others, it owns. the practical view is preferred and it is recorded at the date of the higher purchase agreement. Relevance. Information must be presented on a timely basis and be useful in making decisions. It should have feedback value, which consists of predictive value and confirmatory value so as to influence decision making. An example, an investor takes a decision to invest in a company's shares on the basis of this year's financial statement. He used the predictive value. Next year's financial statement will confirm his decision whether it was a good decision. Reliability. This refers to the trustworthiness of the information, whether it can be depended upon to make accurate decisions. It stems from representational faithfulness, neutrality, free from bias and verifiability. An example, financial statements which have been audited by independent external auditors who has expressed an opinion on them are considered reliable. Welcome back and let me take the opportunity to say those who have not yet subscribed for the channel, you can take the opportunity to do so now. Module 2 will be coming up again next week. Part B, list the five elements of a set, uh, full set of financial statement as required by IRFRS for SMEs. That's the first part of Part B. The five elements of a full set of financial statements. First, we have the Statement of Comprehensive Income. Next, we have the Statement of Financial Position. The Statement of Comprehensive Income is also known as an Income Statement. Statement of Financial Position is a balance sheet. Statement of Changes in Equity. And Statement of Cash Flows, also known as the Cash Flow Statement. And finally, the notes to the financial statements. These all must be present in order for you to have a full set of financial statements as required by RFS for SME. Part two states, state four reason why financial statements do not provide users with all the information they need. Okay. The focus here is on all the information they need. Okay, so four reasons why financial statements do not provide users with all the information they need. First reason, the accounting standards require only items stated 
in the accounting standards to be reported. Therefore, items not stated within may be excluded. And of course, the user may need some of those items that are excluded. Two, it is not cost effective to include all the needs of all its users. Okay, if you were to include everybody's need and satisfy everybody, what's going to happen is your cost of providing the information is going to go up. It may be impossible in a single set of financial statements to meet all needs of all users. Okay, so you are constrained to one set of financial statements that is supposed to satisfy a number of users. Uh, therefore, some people would remain with their needs unmet. And four, financial statement uses the historical costs. Users may need more updated values. And I've added on a fifth one for you. Financial statements uses estimates which are subjective to its preparers. These cannot meet the needs of other people or other users. All right, let me explain what we mean by subjective to preparers. The accountants who prepare them uh, use a certain amount of uh, subjectiveness when they estimate things. Any other accountant or person estimating it might come to a different value. So you could have, uh, when you deal with estimates, what you can have is uh, any number of estimates on a particular item. And part three, give four reasons why the rule of the external auditor is important to users of financial statements. Four reasons why the work of the external auditor is important. One, they express an opinion on the fair presentation of financial statement. Users normally rely on their opinion. Two, reports to shareholders on the performance of management. Okay, they are the watchdog for management and they report to the shareholders on the performance of management. Three, they review internal control for as far as they affect the accuracy of the financial statement. Okay, so we need someone to look out for the internal control and uh, the auditor, external auditor is the one who performs audits upon it and those things can affect the accuracy of the financial statement. Four, independent of the company which has implications about neutrality and bias in the financial statements. Okay, so they are independent of the company. That means they don't work for the company. They report to the shareholders. They don't work for the shareholders either. That means they are independent. And um, if you want to get inf information or financial statements that are free from bias and neutrality, the users, you can get that from the audit did financial statement. Welcome back again. If, it, if you haven't yet subscribed, this is a good time for you to do so, to take the opportunity. If you like the videos that you see, give them the thumbs up. And if you find them helpful and you wish to see much more videos like these, leave a comment in the box below and let me know what you would like to see. Old Bailey Limited is keen to ensure the accuracy of information contained in its accounting record and receive custody of assets such as inventory and cash. State four appropriate controls that may be used in each of the following cases. Accounts receivable, 
and cash at bank. First, we look at four controls for accounts receivable. First, you must have approval of credit by the supervisor's signature. Okay, you must have someone in control of your credit department and uh, they must give approval for the credit. Usually the approval is by their signature. Two, documentation. Actually, three number the invoices. Ensure all credit sales are accounted for. Okay, a number on each one would make you look out for each invoice that you make your credit sale good and you can easily account for them if there's one missing you will know especially if the numbers go in sequential order three we have segregation of duties persons who handle receipts from the debtors should not issue credit notes okay so if you are handling the cash you should not be documenting things like credit note or even the invoices. You should not be recording them. The idea here is to separate the recording function from the custodial function. Those who are handling the accounts and the cash should not also be recording or making out credit notes and invoices timely reconciliation of accounts receivable ledger and sales ledger control account so you must do it on time the account receivable ledger tells you how much your debtors owe you in their individual accounts and these must be tied in with the sales ledger control which is the total of all the accounts receivable in the account receivable ledger or the sales ledger four controls for cash at bank one again we have segregation of duties of receiving recording and payment of cash the idea is the same that you should separate custody and recording Two, use pre-numbered checks for transaction involving cash at bank. Pre-numbered checks will allow you to chase every, every check that was drawn on your bank account. Do regular bank Do regular bank reconciliations. And four, restore such documents for as blank checks and return checks in fireproof cabinets and restrict access to the part d you are the assistant to the chief of finance officer of blooms and shrubs garden center which is at the end of its first year of operation the company has issued 50,000 ordinary shares of 50 cents each and 20,000 7 percent preference shares of one dollar each its profits after taxation for the year to 30th April 2016 were 84,000. The Board of Directors has decided to pay preference dividend and transfer 16,000 to the General Reserve. Prepare the journal entries to record these events. Okay, so um, what we have here is journal entries again. Now, if you look at all the past papers we have done so far from 2013 this is 2016 and we have done 2017 already and 2019 each one of them has journal entries on it for different types of items like these um, so, okay so you would do well to go over those videos and prepare yourself for some of them coming in your exam. Okay, so the issue of the ordinary shares, journal entries. 
right? A company issued 50,000 ordinary shares, 50 cents each, and 20,000, 7% preference shares of $1. So the ordinary shares was cash would be 25,000, 50,000 by 50 cents is $25,000, and it's all ordinary share capital. And there was no premium. So the narrative would be issue of 50,000 ordinary shares at 50 cents each. Okay, the issue of the preference shares. Again, it's the cash, so we get 20,000, $1 each would give us 20,000, 7% preference shares. 20,000. So we issue 20,000 preference shares of $1 each uh, as the narrative. The distribution of the preference dividends. Now notice this one here, you are distributing it. Uh, they didn't say the declaration of the dividend would have taken place some time before the distribution and the amount would have been paid in a life placed in a liability account. Therefore, we have to debit dividend payable of 1400 that's 7% of uh, 20,000. And the cash would be corrected with 14,000. Okay, notice again, here is dividend payable. Okay, it's not just dividend. If you do put dividend alone, it would mean you are now declaring it. Distribution of preferred dividend as a narrative. Transfer of profits to general reserve. Um, the, okay, we, first we have to take it out of retained earnings, 16,000. And uh, then we have to put it in the general reserve, 16,000. Transfer to general reserve, okay. So the 16,000 is given to us here. Okay, that is the last of the journal entries. Today we will be looking at accounting unit 1, 2016 paper 2, module 2. So let's get right into it. First we read what is required. Part A, prepare a partnership statement of comprehensive income for the year ended 31st December 2015, including as much detail as possible. Second, prepare a partnership statement of changes in owner's equity for the year ended 31st December 2015. Okay, Sean an Amin partnership statement of comprehensive income for the year ended 31st of December 2015. First, we put in the sales, and that is 75,000, the net account receivable for 12 months. And then we less the cost of sales from that. Uh, we get the gross profit of 25% of the sales being 225,000. Next, we calculate the debt profit of 15% of the sales, that is 135,000. And then we take the difference between the gross profit and the net profit, we get $90,000 as our expenses. The cost of sales, we take the sales of 900,000 and we minus the gross profit of 225,000. And we get cost of sale 675,000. And then we put in the inventory at the end of December 137,500. And we add back that to the cost of sales, and we'll get the amount that is available 812,500. We put in the inventory for the 1st of January. 2015, we take the ending inventory of 137,500 and we will multiply it by 10 over 11. We the mark it down to the fallen inventory by 10%. And 
Then we put in the purchases as a balancing figure of 6,107,500. Okay, and um, I went through that quite rapidly. Uh, you may want to check through the calculations and see how I got it. And listen to the commentary, okay? In particular, you should check into this here to see how I got the 125,000. Okay, let's move on to the next part. The statement of changes in owner's equity. First, you have to do the working for the current account. And the, that would be equal to the net profit from the income statement minus the salary. And uh, we have 135,000 minus 90,000 in salaries. We have 45,000 to share in the ratio of 3 to 2. Okay. So we will get the equity being the fixed capital. The current mm -hmm. accounts, 3 to 2. This 45,000 that we got here. Shared three to two, and it gives us total equity of eight twenty-seven and six eighteen. Oh, all right, the capital will remain fixed, uh, so you do not add these onto it. You just show these as the uh, investment in the business. All right, one other additional thing: the partners will pay their salaries in cash. This is necessary for their current account balances to be in the ratio 3 to 2. Here, yeah. it will only show the remainder of the profits after the salaries, which would be in the ratio 3 to 2, because the uh, salaries would have been paid 90,000 already. Okay, let me go over that again. Statement of changes in owner's equity. First, we have the workings, current accounts, so would be equal to the net profit minus the salaries, which would be 135 minus 90,000 in salaries, 40,000, 45,000 each. It would give us a remainder profit of 45,000 to be shared 3 to 2. So the current accounts would just have the profits being shared 3 to 2 if it is to remain in the ratio of 3 to 2. Okay, so when we add the fixed capital at the current account, we will get their equity. So this is a statement of changes in owner's equity. Note here, the partners will pay their salaries in cash. This is necessary for their current account balances to be in the ratio 3 to 2. Okay, if we do not pay them in cash before, then the salaries would show up in the current account as unpaid and this balance would no longer be 3 to 2. Part B. List three possible reasons why a business partnership may be dissolved. To explain the difference between judicial and non-judicial dissolution of partnership. And three, identify three steps required to dissolve a partnership. Four, identify four benefits of operating as a cooperative. And five, the two advantages and one disadvantages of a sole proprietor. Three reasons why a partnership may be dissolved. Any three of the following retirement of a partner. Okay, anytime a partner leaves or comes into the business, the partnership would have to be dissolved and a new partnership start. Okay, so retirement of a partner, death of a partner, bankruptcy of a partner. The partner is no longer desire to continue in business. A partner is found 
guilty of misconduct. So those are all reasons why a partnership may be dissolved. The difference between judicial and non-judicial resolution of a partnership. Okay, as the, the answer is in the term itself, judicial. One is where the court intervenes and the other is where the court does not intervene. So non-judicial dissolution of a partnership occurs when there is no need to apply to the court for an order. An example is when a partnership has been entered into for a fixed period of time and the period of time has ended. Judicial dissolution of a partnership is when a partner applies to the court to end a partnership. An example of this is when one of the partners has been found guilty of misconduct and likely to prejudice the carrying on of the business. Steps required to dissolve the partnership. These are the order in which it may go. First, you dispose of the other assets than cash and bank. You share any profit from the disposal of the assets to partners in the agreed ratio in their capital accounts. Okay, so you're going to share the profit in the capital account. And you're going to pay the creditors next, then pay any partners' loans, and then you return to the partners the balance on their capital account. Okay, so it should go in a, a similar order. Four benefits of operating as a cooperative. I have given you here six, you can choose any four, voluntary and open membership, democratic control or one man, one vote, limited interest on capital invested, economic participation of all members in the results of operations, continual education from members, and cooperation with other cooperatives. Okay, so any four of those would suffice. Two advantages of a sole trader. One, no taxation at the entity level, which means the business itself does not pay taxes, although the sole trader himself as a person would pay personal income tax. Okay, but the business itself does not pay taxes. It does not share profit with anyone. All of it belongs to him because it comes from his personal effort. One disadvantage of a sole trader, he has unlimited liability for his debt. Okay, all the debts are payable by him and he's liable for it up to his personal position. Sunshine Bakery existing share capital is 400,000, 800,000 ordinary shares of 50 cents each. The existing shares are traded on the Barbados Stock Exchange at a price of $2 each. The directors decide to make a right issue of 2 for 5 at a price of 150 each. Calculate how many shares will be issued if all the rights are taken up. To all workings, prepare the journal entry without narrative to record the transaction. The workings will be 800,000 shares by two out of for every five, we have 320,000 shares would be issued. The cash would be 320,000 shares from here, multiply by 150 would give us 480,000. The ordinary share capital would be 300,000 shares multiplied by the par value, which would give us 150,000 shares. The share premium would be the price here of 150 
minus the power value so 0 0.5 that will give us 1 and we multiply it by the number of shares we sued we'll get $320,000 therefore the journal entry would be debit cash 480000 credit ordinary shares 160000 and share premium $320,000 okay that brings us to the end of module 2 Let's get right into it. We have here before us a statement of comprehensive income for Ralph, a sole proprietor, a farmer's mart. And we are required to prepare a statement of cash flow for the year ended 31st December 2015. In addition to this, we have a statement of financial position as of 31st December 2015 and give us comparative statement to balance sheet. Okay, I have already read it. You will take your time and you will go into it and read it. Okay. So we also have a statement of changes in owner's equity for the year ended 31st December 2015 and uh, some additional information. I will read through the additional information at the bottom. But I will not be flipping back to it. So from time to time you will pause the video and you will look back at this information to see what I'm working on. During the year equipment with a book value of sixty five thousand was sold for forty thousand. The loss of sale was included in the administrative pages now i put it just as it is in the was in the past paper the loss of sale it should be the loss on sale of the fixed asset of the equipment right selling expenses include an annual depreciation charge of fifty three thousand four hundred a piece of equipment value that one forty three six hundred was purchased during the year by check Current assets at 31 at 31st December 2014 include a cash at bank of 45,000. So this here gives us the opening balance for our cash account. Now there are some workings that we should always do before we start our cash flow statement. Okay, now it may appear to take a long time, but once you get all the workings done, and all you have to do is write up the cash flow statement. Once you are acquainted with the format, then you have no problems. The writing up of the statement itself may take you just a few minutes, and um, but your workings could take you a good 20 minutes or so. That's quite all right. Okay, the first one we need to look at is the profit before interest and taxes this is the figure that you would start the first section with your operating activities you take the net income and you add back the interest and the in and the taxes in this problem we don't have any taxes so we just add these two and this is the profit figure that we will be starting with 45,750 so let's look at the next working Our next booking is the loss on sale of asset. To get that, we take the net book value of 65000 At this stage, you may want to look back and see the, uh, these in the additional information. Proceeds, 40000 and we get the loss of 25000 So let's take a look at the other booking. In the current asset, The total on the first balance sheet, 98,400, and then from the previous year's balance sheet, 2014, 68,900. So we get an increase of 29,500. Okay, this would go into our cash flow statement. 
The next working we look at is the non-current asset account, and it's at book value, so that takes into consideration the depreciation itself. So at this stage, you may want to pause the video and verify these figures from your information on your balance sheet and your comprehensive income statement and the additional information. Okay, so do you notice the balance brought down is 275 each and the balance carry down is 306,000 from the two balance sheets that I give him. Right, the disposal was 65,000 for net book value, depreciation was 53,400. Right, we are told that we bought some additional equipment for 143,600 paying my check. Uh, we are not told about this figure here, but um, if you draw up the account, and that's the only way you would see this. If you didn't draw up this account, you would not see this figure, 85,000, that they're purchasing fixed assets or non-current assets with. It's a balancing figure in this account to make it balanced. Okay, and uh, incidentally, you would notice it's the same amount as the capital introduced, which means he would have taken his private money, bought the equipment, and um, thereby introduced capital at the same time into the business. Okay, so this would be under your investing activities to together with the other purchase of the equipment here. We will now look at the cash flow statement. And I have the three sections in three different slides because they couldn't fit on one slide, okay? So um, afterwards, we'll add up the three different sections in this column here and get our reconciliation, All right? So the net income before interest and taxes was 45750 from our workings. The depreciation from the additional information, 53,400, and the loss on sale of fixed assets has been from our working 25,000. These two, we add them back because they are not involving the movement of cash at all. They are notional figures just calculated and put into the income statement. So we have to add them back to get the cash from the profit. And next we have the increase in current assets. That's a decrease, represents a decrease in cash, 29,500. The increase in trade payables, would the opposite way around to the increase in the current asset. So we add it. The decrease in the accrual, we will minus that. And uh, when we add the entire column, we'll get the net cost, net cash flow from operation being 102,850, and it is an inflow. Okay, if it was an outflow, we'd put it in bracket. Okay, let's move on to the next section. Western activities. In this section, we have the usually the investment in non-current assets and uh, if we have any investment that we make in other companies or other businesses. Okay, so the sale of the equipment that involves non-current assets, we sold it for 40,000 in cash. So that would be an inflow of cash. The purchase of the equipment, around 43,600. You will want to check that back and the 85,000 that was uh, introduced to buy more equipment would give us an outflow of 228,600. And the, when we add those two together, we get a net cash flow from investing activities of 188,600. Okay, let's move on to the next section. The financing activities and these usually revolve around what 
takes place in our long-term liabilities and in our capital accounts. And first, we paid interest of 22,800, and that would be on a, on a long-term loan. So that's an outflow of cash. Then we have the drawings by the owner, that would be 21,450, another outflow of cash. That we paid part of the loan, it was 140,000 in the first balance sheet, and then we have it as a 125 in our balance sheet. So that gives us a difference of 15,000 would have been paid. Then we have the owner introducing 85,000 in capital into the business as a financing activity, but this time it's an inflow of cash. When we add these together, we get a net inflow of $25,750. Now, continuing into the reconciliation here, when we add the other two activities together, the net cash flow from them, and this cash flow from financing here, we get a decrease in cash of $60,000. And the balance, in, balance brought forward is 45000 that we had in the note, the additional note, 45000 uh, The balance carry forward is in the balance sheet, which will give us an overdraft of $15,000. So that brings us to the end of this part of the question. We'll move on to the next part. Do we have here part B? Two independent scenarios, and we are asked to discuss the proper accounting treatment of each, including any required disclosures according to IFRS for ISM, SME Section 21, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. Give the rationale for your answer. Right. So um, if you have never read this section, you should what you should do is pause the video, go get your textbook and read up on section 21 IFRS for SMEs. If you don't have a textbook, you can go to Google and type in this same thing here and put PDF after it. It will give you a PDF file with the provision contingent liabilities and contingent assets. How the to treat them in the accounts of small and medium-sized enterprises. Okay, um, I have already done that, so I will continue on with the video. But if you do not do that, you will not know what I am talking about in this video. Okay, if you have never read that section of the IFRS, you would not know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now I have here summarized in this diagram here how to the accounting treatment for contingent liabilities and provision. It depends on their probability. The accounting treatment depends on their probability. You start in the middle here. If the liability is reasonably possible, then you will make a note in the account, in the financial, note to the financial statement. If it is reasonably possible, that means it's around 50% possible. If it is probable, that means it is greater than 50% probable, and you have to make an accrual in your account first. Okay? And if it is remotely probable, then that means it's less than 50%, and you can ignore it, or you could still make the note in the financial statement. Okay? Right, and there is an other, other condition that you have to ask that will be asking in the other two scenarios when I look at them.
Good, we look at scenario one. In August 2015, a worker was injured in a factory in an accident, partially due to his own negligence. His worker was has sued Rooney Company for 800,000. Legal counsel believes it is reasonably possible that the outcome of the suit will be unfavorable, that is, the company will lose the case, and that the settlement would cost the company between 250,000 and 500,000. Okay, so let's invoke our um, chart here. All right, it says it is reasonably possible. Okay, so it's fall here. And um, we normally we will ask the question, it is a present obligation, it is the result of past events, and it is reasonably possible. So, all right, we know that we could provide for it. Or in this case, we make a footnote or a note to the financial statement for the amount. A worker has sued Rooney and Company for 800,000. Legal counsel believes it is reasonable possible that the outcome will be unfavorable and that the settlement would cost the company between 250,000 and $500,000. Okay, notice I use the same terminology that I got here, right? You could do the same as well, right? So you have, in order for it to qualify as a provision or a contingent liability, after reading the IFRS, you would see that it must be a present obligation and it must be the result of a past event. And then it must be reasonably possible or probable or remotely possible. A suit scenario two a suit for breach of contract seeking damages two million four hundred thousand was filed by an author against early company on fourth october twenty fifteen. Early legal counsel believes that an unfavorable outcome is probable. A reasonable estimate of the reward to the plaintiff is between 600000 and 1800000 The potential damages are best reflected by the estimate. Okay. Again, we bring up our chart and we realize it's a present obligation. We look at the date and it's a result of a past event. Somebody did something in the past, and it is probable, right? It is yes, probable. So we will have to accrue for it here. That is, we will make a journal entry. Okay, so our general journal would we would debit the profit and loss account and credit provision for loss on keys, and this provision here would be. Uh, liability in case right now the estimate is done by uh, taking these two figures an average of it of twelve hundred thousand okay we move on to the next part of the question Then we are dealing with some current and long-term liabilities on December 2015. The liabilities outstanding at Manning Corporation included the following. And uh, we are given four liabilities and plus uh, another situation with some common stuff. Instructions. Prepare a partial balance sheet for Manning Corporation showing the manner in which the above liabilities should be presented at 31st December 2015. The liabilities should be properly classified as either current or long term. Appropriate note disclosure should be included. Right, so we have here a note payable to the National Bank of 300,000. 
we will head up our answer Manning Corporation balance sheet extract as at 31st December 2015 the current liabilities section and the non-current liabilities section so the note payable is payable in 2017 so that's uh, more than a year away from this balance sheet date so we will have that in our non current liability section okay the next one is cash dividends on common stock declared on the 15 december 2015 60,000 player payable on the 6th of january 2016 so this is just a few days away so we have to put it under current liabilities and next item note payable to admire state bank 470,000 due on the 6th of january 2016 so this is this again falls on the category of uh, the current liabilities and serial bond 1 million of which 250 is maturing during 2016 the only part of it is current and the next part is long term so we put the part that is current on the current liabilities and the part that's long term on the long term liabilities so we have uh, another item here on the 5th of january this is post balance sheet event event of occurring after the balance sheet did 40,000 shares of common stock will be issued for 350,000 300,000 of the proceeds will be used to liquidate the note payable to the national bank right so the item that this affects in the is about is this year this 470 is giving us additional information after the balance sheet date about how they're going to liquidate this year so we could put a note in our financial note to the financial statement on 5th january 2016 40,000 common shares will be issued for 350,000 200,000 of the proceeds will be used to liquidate the note payable to the third national bank okay so this item concerns this year um, we need to note it in the notes to the financial statement so that would bring us to the end of the module and uh, i hope it was helpful to you and that you will give it the thumbs up and see you in the next video